Many thanks to both our discussants. I think um, I love Stefan's phrase about constructing a coherent narrative from an incoherent literature. I remember that. I'm also struck by this tension or dilemma between putting jobs centre stage and the fact that many of the steps we're talking about are not easy <laughs> to engineer with public <coughs> policy and what exactly is the meaning there and how could you easily convert that into a tractable agenda for a politician or for another policy maker. Okay, let's move now quickly to the audience. We want to have as much time as possible for this. And uh, if we start with Ruth, um, please introduce yourself and uh, go for about a minute each. Have we got a microphone over this side of the room? Yep. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Um, thanks, Andy. My name is Ruth Kelly, and I work for Oxfam. It's really great report, so thanks um, so much. Uh, just one quick comment and then a, and a question. Um, on in terms of rights um, and kind of the rights basis, one of the things that struck me is the while there was a focus on kind of making sure that the investment climate was right, that property rights were right for businesses, there didn't seem to be a corresponding kind of focus on, on assets and kind of ownership of rights by, by poor people. And when we're talking about a situation where not only do we need more jobs, but jobs are incredibly precarious with economic crises and people need assets like land to fall back on, that kind of narrative of moving off the land into employment seems to be challenged so I'd be interested how you'd respond to that and then just a question on um, uh, I mean I find a little bit disappointing that household and kind of care economy data was not included I think that given how difficult the data on jobs is it wouldn't have been hard to bring in some kind of time <coughs> use management data to account for idleness to kind of look at particularly women how women contribute to the economy both in in kind of like income generating and non-income generating ways and just uh, I b wonder if you could give a little bit more of an explanation as to why you chose not to. Thanks. Thanks very much. Let's take a couple more questions. Yeah. Rich? Hi. Uh, my name is yeah. mm -hmm. Ben Moxham from the TUC. Um, we, we warmly welcome this report. We think it's long overdue. Um, the conclusions are, are many that we, that, we, that we strongly share. And we really only have a handful of small, smaller points, which I'm sure the ILO, the ITUC have taken up with you. Mm -hmm. So instead, I wanted to, to really ask a question for Stefan and, and Difford's potential response to this. Um, we've just done an audit of Difford's own work against the decent work agenda, and we think you have a tremendous amount to learn from this report. And I'd just like to pick out a few examples. Um, <laughs> jobs, take peop jobs take people out of poverty, um, of course. So why doesn't Difford measure the number of jobs it creates under its annual results framework? Uh, it doesn't do that at the moment. Um, Good jobs, uh, you know, good for development. Um, Diffid is now providing a large amount of support to the private sector, but in many cases, you know, that could be judged by incomes, productivity improvements, respect for rights at work. In many cases, we simply don't see uh, those interventions leading to those results. Um, I thought the WDR had a very, very sober, objective, sensible take on, on labour market institutions, which we really, really welcome. Um, also, the call for, you know, respecting fundamental rights at work, capacity building for labour inspectorates. Um, we've surveyed a lot of Difford's work and it's very, very hard to find any examples of, of Difford actually supporting developing countries in improving their labour market institutions or, or labour inspectorates. And then the, the final point would be around working with the International Labour Organisation. I noticed mm -hmm. the bank doesn't really mention it very much in the report and I think that's more due to you know, institutional positioning than anything else. But, but to what extent can Difford step up its collaboration with the ILO on, on these vital areas, given it's rising up the agenda? Uh, and given Difford has cut off its support to the ILO a couple of years ago and now ranks second last in all donors in terms of ILO support? Thanks very much, Ben. Um, Sheila. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, Sheila Page, ODI. Uh, one question on method first. I was very disturbed by the, the, the pyramid of which jobs do best in which circumstances, which gave great detail of exactly what you should do if you're an agrarian economy or whatever. What is the basis for this? I mean, it sounds as if it's case studies of countries which are currently going through these processes rather than case studies, and rather better than case studies, of countries which have actually succeeded by doing any of this. I mean, I come back to Stefan's point on the fact that there are a lot of microenterprises about doesn't mean that you necessarily want to encourage more micro-enterprises. So if you could say a little bit about mm -hmm. how seriously we should take that table. And similarly on some of the other analyses, I mean, the Bangladesh girls uh, with mothers in factories are more likely to go into education. Is this a labor effect? Is it an example effect? Is it an income effect? 
I mean, we, it's unfair to ask you to do a complete 300-page report in uh, this time, but I think you could have said more on the bases for some of these things. And on the policy side, uh, I realize the data are awful. I mean, we all say that about all of our work. But uh, <laughs> you really don't give any indication of which of the policies might do most. Uh, and particularly, which of the, whether the international policies, for example, migration, would make a significant effect relative to some of the national ones. I mean, you don't hesitate in the bank to make uh, rather um, ambitious <laughs> estimates of trade effects and trade liberalization effects. Why can't you do something similar on migration? And just a final thing, I, I do think it's slightly odd to come to ODI and assume that none of us is capable of reading a full-length report. However you went, <laughs> assuming that. Um, I'll take, actually, those three comments now, and then we'll, uh, we'll go for some more. Um, Kathleen, do you want to start? Sure, yeah. sure. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and comments. Uh, I'll start with the last comment. <laughs> I, I, I sincerely apologize if I offended anyone. Uh, that comment mainly came out of uh, several presentations we've done where even discussants got up and said, okay, I haven't read the report. And there's sort of this bit of a joke that nobody, nobody actually reads a full WDR because they're so long. And when you look at the report, what you will find is it doesn't refer to different chapters. It, it tries to say within a chapter so that people can read pieces and walk away with a clear understanding without feeling like they have to tackle the whole report. I hope, I hope many of you read the entire report. I would love that. You know, that would be wonderful. Um, hope you enjoy it if you, if you do. <laughs> Um, so a, f a few um, uh, quick responses, um, n not in sort of well maybe in the order in which they were mentioned, a few of them. Um, I won't get to all of them. On the care economy, to be really clear, when we, when we look at, say, labor market participation rates or what we call employment rates or unemployment rates, we are including anyone who is working in any sort of informal enterprise. So the traditional category the ILO would call unpaid family worker. That's included in there. What we're not including is someone who's taking care of a sick relative inside their household, someone who is cooking and cleaning inside the household. And mainly we were trying to stay within the, defin the statistical definition set out by the ILO and sort of international labor statisticians by adhering to those um, constructs. But I will refer you to last year's World Development Report on Gender, which did talk a lot about time use and the care economy and women and how that kind of skews maybe the labor picture when we stick with this statistical national accounts approach to labor. Um, on the ILO and, and reference to the ILO in the report, what, uh, I'll take a step back and just give you a bit of a context. I think what you'll find in this report is it doesn't refer to bank work, actually. And I believe there's only one bank project that is, is actively discussed in the report, which... Wh which which is actually a joint uh, World Bank Group ILO program, the Better Work Program, Better work program. which is about uh, upgrading conditions in garment factories. So as Kathleen said, we, we, we actually don't uh, mention uh, yeah, specific institutional projects. And we didn't want this report to be a reflection of the bank's work on labor per se or the ILO. Um, we do have a box about decent work in the middle of the report to try to sharpen the differentiation between what we're calling good jobs for development and decent work. And, and we see them as very different and they complement each other. They're not competing terms. We're not trying to replace a decent work, uh, the decent work agenda, but we're bringing, a, I think, a different, a different view and we can talk more about that if people want to uh, discuss it. Um, you know, I appreciate Stefan's point. I think it was Sheila's point about micro enterprises. And one of our tweets is actually just, to, just makes the point, informal is normal. So it's not so much to say let's embrace microenterprises, but that's a starting place in a lot of countries. It doesn't mean that's where the l labor will sort of ev evolve and develop and grow, but that's where the poorest countries are at. And if we, ca if we don't recognize that and we focus on s SMEs, we may come up with a very different policy agenda. So it's sort of recognize where you're starting from and move from there. It doesn't mean you have to um, think that microenterprises are the solution in those countries. Um, to clarify a little bit of the Bangladesh example, uh, so Dina cites a study um, done by Rachel Heath and um, Mubarak, Mushfik Mubarak, uh, Mubarak uh, and what they show is, um, my reading, my re recollection of the study is girls who live near a factory, regardless of what their household does, but just live near a factory that's employing women, see this different future. Now it could be they see a return to education, right, classic 
economic argument around why do people invest in schooling. But they also see a different identity, a different pathway, delayed marriage, uh, lots of different things in their future. And what we observe in their study is that girls are much <coughs> more, more likely to go to school and they respond very differently to these local uh, labor market opportunities for women than the boys do in their community and than girls who live in communities without these, these uh, manufacturing establishments. So it's sort of a demonstration effect that's changing the way people think about their future in the labor market. Um, you know, the, the challenge with the WDR, uh, we, we, at the onset of this report, the, the previous World Bank president really encouraged us to ask tr uh, difficult questions, to challenge the conventional wisdom, and said if you can't come up with an answer, you, if you don't have the answer by the end of the year, you don't have the answer. Um, he also set out that this is not a policy document. It's not a prescription for the bank. I mean, the bank's challenge is to sort of under, to hopefully read the report and then think forward, what does this mean for bank policy? Or for other institutions, what will it mean for their policy? And that's, the, that's going to be our challenge going forward. So, you know, you don't have these crisp policy answers coming out of the report. How do we think, how will this affect how the bank operationalizes in, into the future around jobs? And what I, what I think is clearly coming out of the report is that we can't put a labor agenda into a silo. And it, it sort of fails. I mean, we, you end up with this focus on labor market institutions. So this multi-sectoral approach is, is going to be a very <laughs> challenging one for the bank to overcome. Because we do, you know, we put infrastructure here and agriculture here and private sector development here. And these groups don't talk. And, and how to kind of get them talking is you know, what the next few years will be about. Thank you very much. David. Can I just, I'll just make uh, th three points to c compliment um, uh, Kathleen's uh, uh, responses. So um, th th your question about the, uh, Sheila, about the case studies. Um, so that chapter is based on, um, uh, yes, case studies that um, uh, we commissioned um, from uh, country teams um, based in the eight different uh, countries um, uh, that uh, we looked at, um, uh, so Mozambique for agrarian, and um, Bangladesh for urbanizing, et cetera. And those are case studies where local researchers were applying the framework and doing um, their own analysis of uh, the three transformations and their effect on jobs. But we combine that in the chapter six where this is discussed um, with uh, existing research uh, and analysis of um, what, uh, uh, what we find in, in those types of countries. And then in the final chapter, we actually have uh, examples on each of those typologies based on um, successful countries. So the Vietnam example I mentioned, the Chile, uh, uh, example I mentioned. So that table is sort of a stylized table that's based on the compilation of uh, existing published um, uh, work, but then the uh, the ongoing work on the case studies, which will come out as a separate volume, uh, we hope next year. Um, a, a second point is on the on the policy specifics, um, building on what Kathleen said. The WDR, of course, is a you know global report and tends to be pr quite broad, but what's happening, which is also what happened with a lot of the previous WDRs, is, is that uh, our regional colleagues are doing companion pieces, which are going into a lot more depth on um, the situation at the regional level. So there's a companion uh, uh, underway for um, the Europe Central Asia region, East Asia, pr pretty much every region which will be coming out over the next year, and also a focused one is going to be started on, on gender issues. So um, what a lot of these WDRs are, do is set up a framework where then uh, more specifics, which with a lot more policy richness, um, come out at the regional level. Um, and then finally, the point on rights. Um, uh, I, I didn't mean to sort of gloss over the fundamentals to suggest that the um, uh, respect for property rights, et cetera, was only about um, the sort of enterprise perspective. But um, what, we, uh, what we try to say in the report is that um, uh, property rights are important for the welfare of, of the poor and livelihood, et, et cetera. So um, uh, that was the intention that the the, of the report there. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much indeed. I think uh, there was also a sense around whether the bank's economic work can be a bit bolder about quantifying some migration mm. policy mm -hmm. benefits, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting. Maybe you can hold that for the final mm -hmm. sum up, but I think it's a useful one. Um, Stefan. Yes, I, I, I think I have a few questions here on, uh, on, on, on DFID and, 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 and jobs. Um, I appreciate very much these, these, these questions. Um, the, but actually, I, I think um, 
we do quite a lot of work with private sector, but actually the, f the primary uh, target and the result that we actually typically are trying to put forward is to do with jobs. Now, there are good reasons why uh, we can't sometimes bring them out as easily, and there's a lot to do with measurement here. Uh, if we look at what's happening in jobs, in fact, the WDR has all the answers why we have it so difficult. It's the job churning problem, you know, the net job creation. You know, we, we, can, we can support, say, an industrial plant being developed and so many jobs being created, but we don't know whether we simply displace jobs from elsewhere or what did we do, or the same with a particular policy of, of, of how we're actually doing it. So it's a really tricky thing, and in fact, I've been spending quite a lot of my time talking to, to many of the teams to trying to bring this in further. Having said that, for example, CDC in the strategic framework, you should have a look at it, what it now has to do, but it has to actually, it gets extra bonus points, so to speak, in, uh, in its investment portfolio now, it creates jobs, and the gr job creation is actually extremely high on the agenda now. So I think that's, that's quite important. Something we may be doing less, and actually I say oh maybe, because I, can't, I don't know my, our entire portfolio on labor markets in this respect. We may be doing less on labor market institutions, regulation, and so on, and the things that you suggest. But I think actually um, WDR tells us why we shouldn't necessarily do this. This is because, uh, you know, in many of these countries, starting uh, st uh, having an entry point with labor market policies to do with regulation of the former sector labor markets is probably is not so clear what what uh, what uh, what uh, whether that that's the the place where you start if job creation and better job creation is where you go on the ILO point, well, the ILO went through the, um, like any other, other multilateral organization to the multilateral aid review, and uh, which is essentially an, an institutional audit in terms of how to what extent is the institution aligned with our objectives, but also to what extent is it effective and value for money in delivering our uh, the kind of results we're interested in. ILO didn't score too well, and I think that's the reason why it actually, at the moment, is not receiving the funding. We know it has new leadership. I'm not in a position to comment on it, but uh, I know that my colleagues in that department are all the time watching what's going on and whether we're going to support them more or not is definitely not, not up to me to say, but I would, looking back at it, there was some, some grants to, uh, to do this. Thank you very much indeed, Stefan. I think, let's take another round of comments, Dirk. You've been a microphone no, we need a microphone to you. Yeah, there's a mic coming. Dirk Tavell from, uh, from ODI. Um, congratulations on the, on the report, the WDR. Um, and uh, as she was said, we do read reports. So I read um, <laughs> uh, in particular a great interest chapter uh, three, which is, uh, <laughs> which is uh, a very interesting chapter. And it's about sort of the productivity <laughs> transformations um, and uh, particularly labor productivity. And there you start out saying, well, uh, th thinking about where does labor productivity change happen? Is it within firms? Is it between firms? Is it between sectors? And actually, uh, the conclusion to me seems to be that we know, we know very little uh, on this, uh, in this area. In particular, you, I mean you, had, you have done a good uh, and decent job uh, summarizing it all. Um, um, but there's, uh, there's a big gap there in terms of low-income countries and also with respect to sectors. So you, there's a lot more on agriculture, a bit more on manufacturing, but on services. You, I think you only cite one, one study there, and we know very little there in that area. Uh, but then, at the end of that chapter, and also um, uh, somewhere else, you, you then say, well, there is a case for targeted uh, interventions. And, um, and also at the sort of the conventional wisdom um, that you mentioned is, uh, is, um, is about a targeted investment climate. And you say that the conventional wisdom is that level, level playing field is preferable because governments do not have in enough information to pick winners and, and, uh, and so on. The, uh, the, um, the report seems to suggest that actually the conventional wisdom there is, is partly wrong and that actually you can do more uh, and you, you, there is a, a case for, for more targeted support than you were saying in the World Development Report of 2005. And I'd like some confirmation on that, that, that you have you turned that corner and how are you then, um, then change the conventional wisdom at least in the, in the World Bank? I mean, I know that it wasn't conventional wisdom for, for all because uh, here's the head of the JICA, Lon uh, London here, who of course uh, firmly believes that targeted intervention do, do, do work uh, quite well under certain circumstances. So I'd like to hear some, something more on that. And in particular, what, what is a targeted intervention? What, 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 what policies work best? Is it infrastructure? Is it skills? Is it... Is it uh, uh, R&D, uh, what sort of interventions can we think of? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, 
My name is Brendan Martin, Public World in London. Um, I was struck by the two discussants um, by how the same report can be interpreted so very differently. Um, and in particular by, by Stefan's comment, which seemed to leap from the factual observation in this excellent report, and may I add my congratulations, um, which seemed to leap from the factual observation that 90% of jobs are created by the private sector to the conclusion that therefore it's all about private sector growth. And it seems to me that actually the central message of this report is precisely the opposite of that. It's that it's all about, it's, it's that pr if, if, if you wanted to put it in a nutshell in those terms, it seems to me the report is saying private sector growth should be about the creation of jobs and specifically about the creation of good jobs as defined and jobs also that apply, that um, comply with decent work standards. Or I think as Pedro was putting it in general, in those two as part of a wider agenda of inclusive growth. So I'd be very worried if the interpretation that Diffid was going to make of this was essentially business as usual, because that's what I took from Stefan's remarks. Thank you, Brandon. Any more questions? Yes, behind her. Thanks. Uh, Tina Weller from CAFOD. Um, I wanted to pick up on the issue of microenterprises. It's been something we've been working on and in relation to the bank's work for s quite some time. So, we have, you know, congratulations, very pleased with uh, some of the findings in the report in this respect. Um, and I'd agree with the observation that it, it may not be where we want to be in the future, but it's where we're at, and including in OECD countries, the small businesses make a huge amount of employment. And I liked the um, conclusion that you drew that this meant that the policy analysis might look very different if you take that as your starting position. And I was wondering, you were talking about the job of work that you have to do at the bank, whether you're feeding those kind of findings into the review of the doing business indicators, for example, being something that we're particularly interested in that we don't think works particularly well for the priorities of small businesses. Okay. Thanks very much. I think, um, well... That's good timing. Um, I think I'll go back to the panel at this point. Pedro, let's, let's <coughs> come across this way. Do you have any responses? Uh, do you want to pick up any points from the discussion? No. no. <laughs> 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 Stefan, I think you've had as many questions <laughs> as the presenters. Uh, yes, sorry, I, I didn't want to uh, <laughs> distract from an excellent report. And I, I, um, um, I think I'm going to effectively try to repeat two of the four points I was trying to make. And so first of all, I think the way we definitely like to think of it, I would say personally also in, and intellectually in the way I would uh, also interpret the link between the things that we do at DFID and what the report is telling us, is that we need to bring jobs much more at the center as the way that actually is the mediating factor <coughs> between a lot of the growth processes that are taking place and the outcomes in development and in poverty that we're getting at. I think a big, big lesson for us in terms of that is not business as usual is to is to say, well, let's just do any kind, uh, let's just do growth. Poverty reduction will always, by necessity, follow in the same way. If we have other problems, we do maybe I don't know social protection, social safety nets, which would be a very. I'm not saying that that's where DFID is, but I would say we bring a much bigger recognition that actually the process of job creation is an uh, is an essential part of that translation from growth into poverty, into poverty reduction. I take at the, so, so that's, that's an essential bit. And so the big question is really, and I think the report tries to, uh, uh, to, to uh, raises the question, answers it partially, what are the maybe the kind of things we may want to think about to trying to actually get towards that outcome. But that's also the comment of Derek Willem was, was suggesting in a lot of these things, good jobs that earn a lot with good labor productivity, with good higher productivity and so on, they're not easily, quote unquote, created. You don't engineer them in a simple social engineering sense that they will be there. And that's the essential part. A sustainable job is going to be one with high labor productivity. And Dirk Will knows well enough, as I do, as, as many of the other people here, we will debate endlessly in saying, you know, is there literature there that we can really know? Peter will join in, no, no doubt. Is what is it exactly we do? How, more, how, how can we engineer this more? How can we can engineer this less to get it in a sustainable way? 
So leads me to the, 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 this other point is that what, what about private sector growth? Well, I think here, and I think there is definitely somewhere, there, there is definitely a, a notion in the report, it's the growth process where the private sector will have to play a big role in it, that we have to, f uh, that, that in the end we'll need to deliver it. The big question is what you do around it. And that is like actually where, where I don't think we are so be able to be so clear what exactly we do. Is it just the fundamentals that we get right? I don't think so, because then we see, as we, for example, seen a lot of growth in, in, in Africa at the moment, natural resource booms, lots of growth in GDP, but not necessarily job creation. And then we're asking ourselves, well, actually, what is it that you can do? And I'm actually more pointing out, I think <laughs> exactly knowing, for example, how to create jobs with high labor productivity in a city context is a very hard one. And you have case studies and suggestions how, how to do it. Is there consensus how to do this? I think that would be overstating so stating the question. So I'm a little bit more here presenting it. It's not business as usual. I just want to be clear in terms of an agnostic uh, element here that we're not <coughs> entirely sure uh, very well what is the most efficient way of getting that process going. I think it's the biggest challenge of it. Recently, if it has been writing this internal document, but soon I'm sure we'll start circulating as well, is rethinking growth policies. Well, the first thing is to actually say, is actually the point that the report now makes, is that we should dare to look at labor intensity of growth as a good on its own. So there may well have to be trade-offs between growth and labor intensity of growth. But again, what you do, because partly there, isn't, there is a good in the way that you have a very good language on social cohesion and so on. Of, of having actually growth that creates jobs is better than growth that doesn't create jobs. It would actually mean in a calculus that, the, that a form of inclusive growth may be that is 8% may be better than a growth that is 10%. Now, that actually is a quite a big move forward mm -hmm. in terms of doing it. But I don't say that we know how to do it. But I still stick to the point, what are the institutional setups? That how can we lift the constraints in such a way that private sector ends up delivering these things? Because we are not just going to do that growth on our own that creates these jobs in a sustainable way. Thank you. Thank sure. I, um, I think that was a really nice um, uh, summary of, of, of sort of where we come out also in this um, discussion on the difficult question on um, growth strategies versus job strategies. And I think, um, uh, Pedro, you picked up that this isn't so um, uh, black and white as the question might suggest. And where we come out is to say that where uh, that, that um, uh, growth strategies need to be considered through um, this uh, lens of these three transformations and having jobs um, uh, more center stage and understanding how uh, uh, strategies can uh, maximize uh, the transformational um, uh, benefits and that um, in most cases um, there are trade-offs that need to be managed so that uh, this, uh, development strategies need to take that into account. Um, I think a, a last point I'll make uh, before I pass on to Kathleen is on the, um, the role of labor market policies and um, I think a number of people have picked up and uh, welcomed um, the message that it's not all about the, uh, the labor market, but I, I think we also want to suggest that that does not mean that we think that labor market policies are not important and that we shouldn't uh, analyze their impacts and um, continue to put them in our <laughs> research programs. Um, I think uh, obviously determining when countries are off the cliffs uh, are important, but also you know one of the findings is that even for countries on the plateau that there are important distributional effects that um, can uh, have uh, uh, policies can have on on youth on women, et cetera, and so understanding how these policies really can um, yeah. uh, contribute in, in important ways um, and can be improved um, continues to be a, a research agenda for all of us. So before Kathy close, can I just yeah, say sure. what, one quick what sentence is that actually, uh, just to emphasize that, you know, the, the biggest research program that I have under my portfolio as chief economist is actually on labor markets. <laughs> so that is the <laughs> biggest thing. We don't want to say we don't need to look at it and keep on understanding it. Yeah, I was uh, glad of those closing uh, comments from you, Dina, because I the, the thing about too much or too little regulation seems too blunt to me. There should be a middle ground of smart regulation mm -hmm. that protects jobs and rights mm -hmm. together. But anyway, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, Dirk, your, your comments about the productivity discussion in Chapter 3 are, are very appreciated. And um, just to kind of give a little bit of background, the the view in chap the way chapter three is framed around the pro productivity and what do we know about low-income countries is you know there is this tension between uh, increasing productivity 
versus looking at the facts where we have them, where we do have some statistics on the dispersion of productivity in low-income countries and this notion that if labor could reallocate, you could have this gain in productivity not coming from sort of a, a true growth in productivity but just a reallocation, a, a, you know, a, a win from re reallocation, which raises the big question of why aren't we seeing reallocation in India, for example? You know, is it the Industrial Disputes Act that's keeping labor from reallocating? Is it something else? And, and to go back to an earlier point about the lack of a political economy view in the report, which I think is a, is a fair point, and we don't talk much about that, but I think where we do is if you go back to uh, this uh, framework for thinking about <coughs> constraints, we acknowledge that you may know what your constraint is. You may, you may believe, and I'm not saying I believe this, but you may believe your constraint in India is the Industrial Disputes Act, that that is, quote unquote, the problem. But you may recognize that you're not going to get rid of that that act, that act is here to stay. So the issue is can you offset acts? And we've seen countries that have fairly restrictive acts offset them in ways. And those ways may be very much outside traditional labor market policy, where you decide to build roads and ports and how you invest in skills. So that's a little bit of a political economy view, a, a little bit. Um, so we asked this question about in targeted investment climate, and, and it's, um, you know, we start with the conventional wisdom is the level playing field. Like, don't pick winners. Governments can't pick <coughs> winners. But there are camps of people who believe in, you know, a, a approach about around industrial policy. And I will not name any names. But um, <laughs> where, we, where we try to focus a bit of the discussion is to say, okay, well, industrial policy is one view. But what if we think about a targeted investment climate that's not at the sectoral level? By, by sector, I mean, I mean, like, what you're manufacturing. It could be maybe an approach uh, in terms of uh, location in the country, a spatial dimension to targeted investment. Where are you going to put your roads? It could be with regards to policies that are geared towards small versus large firms. So it's a bit kind of opening up the discussion away from these corners where the discussion often ends up being, which is don't pick winners versus pick your sectoral winners and go with that. So we're trying to bring a little more nuance to it. Um, we also, one of our tweets is, private sector creates jobs. Mm -hmm. And we start with the view that not, no, the statistic, 90% of people who are working are working in the private sector in the world. But there is a, a very important role for policy in the public sector. It, it's critical, because policy will set the stage. Um, that being said, you have interesting exceptions in India. You know, you have the, um, the employment guarantee scheme, which is putting mm -hmm. a lot of people to work. So there may be places where there's a role for the public sector to generate jobs, but on average, th the jobs will be in the private sector. The question is, what, how is policy going to facilitate what kind of jobs come out of that? And where is the enforcement around you know, core labor standards and, and rights? Um, and I'll leave you with one observation, because I, I was reminded of it when we talk about the very beginning about the Arab Spring. Um, you, you take Tunisia, where the Arab Spring um, started. Uh, Tunisia had outstanding growth. Like, you know, high, high growth in the region. In a region of high growth, it had above average growth rates. Um, the young man who uh, set himself on fire to protest his job situation was not unemployed. This was not a situation of someone who was unemployed. He was working as a vendor. His problem was not, at least in the day-to-day, -day necessarily his, the labor market regulations, but harassment by local officials. So you have a situation of high growth. You have uh, uh, people who are working but not in the formal sector. You have a lot of official unemployment, but they're very high educated, um, wealthier people. So you have a very complicated situation in Tunisia that, that I think we, we was our starting point ref for reflecting on jobs and, and how do we think about, about jobs um, and, and the role in development. And I'll leave you with one final um, observation that came up at an event we were at about a week and a half ago. Um, one of our discussants pointed out that if you look at, I think, the four volumes of the Handbook of Labor Economics, he counted two chapters that covered developing countries. So even our framework for thinking about labor and jobs is so skewed towards the West. We, you know, we, we, have, we don't have a lot of answers in here. We're really looking towards the future to hopefully think about new models and, and ways of um, analyzing labor. Well, many thanks. Um, thanks to uh, Kathleen and Dina for the excellent presentation and to Stefan and Pedro for the comments. Um, we have some refreshments now if anyone wants to stay and chat. Um, but yeah, no. thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you.